as far as dear Heavenly Father thank you for this morning thank you for giving us truth Father we know that that's what sets us free and we're just so grateful to you for all that you've done for us for saving us and for sanctifying us thank you for this congregation for this church for keeping the doors open for keeping it warm such a wonderful place of peace and contentment. May we never become familiar with it. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for introducing one to the other for this kind of special fellowship on a Sunday morning. We do pray for those in the congregation that can't be with us this morning, that we're with them in spirit, and we're grateful to you for being able to get them the messages after the fact, regardless of the attacks we receive from the kingdom of darkness to the contrary. We pray for those that are still lost in this world without hope, that they be humbled and receive saving faith before it's too late. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to make moments in time like this reality for all of us. Just a chance to be washed over and replenished, and re-energized. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right. Part 13, the book of Hebrews. Please ensure you read this week's blog up here on the board. It was titled, or is titled, The Most Underrated Verse in Holy Scripture. Please read that. It's really important. Fantastic um, insertion into our overall curriculum here in this ministry. Um, it is yet another foray into the topic of context. And that makes four in a row four in a row on the topic of context. As you know, we have been focusing on the audience of Hebrews, trying to get that context for this beautiful book that we're studying here, and we're taking our time. I love it because we're really just sort of basking in this beautiful book, and we're going to get it right. And we're going to enjoy it together. We haven't even really started to read it. We're just seeing what the context is. Extremely valuable exercise whenever we read any book in Holy Scripture. What we've already learned is that this particular congregation was struggling because of their circumstances. So you had a shepherd writing to a flock, encouraging them because they were struggling, because they were under attack. So we concluded that this beautiful book had a real purpose when it was written. Up here on the board, the book of Hebrews was like a dart thrown by a master dart player. Very specific. Think of a dart board, right? Not a, it's not always appropriate to aim for the bullseye. You aim for certain slivers around it and wedges and this kind of a thing. And so he had a very specific reason for writing this book to this specific audience. And that's where the context comes in. If you read it the way we've been reading it and study it the way we've been studying it, you realize that point on the board is true. The book of Hebrews was like a dart thrown by a master dart player. Specific circumstances, therefore specific purpose. Here's the summary point the Spirit's been developing with us as of late up here on the board. Regarding this audience of Hebrews, this was a church in crisis for several reasons. We spent last week delving into this. It had lost its original leaders. They had died off already. It was under constant attack, which made sense given the environment they were in. Some members were failing to fellowship together. And some had already defected, or as we would say theologically, apostatized left the faith. There was a perfect storm brewing. 
put all these pieces together in terms of context, and you can start understanding why this book was written. Last time, we got through most of what's on the board, and of course, we reviewed it on Thursday evening. So we want to pick up where we left off last time, because I didn't finish. We ended with Hebrews 12, 12 through 17, so I want to quickly review that and then press on. Um, remember that in this particular passage, we find the writer encouraging this local assembly to stand up for one another. I didn't say to go there yet. Why is everybody turning? Carol, Pat, what are you doing? Were you the, were you the teacher's pets back in school? Remember that this particular passage we find with a writer encouraging this local assembly to stand up for one another. If you remember, stand up for one another. Honestly, if you see a member that's in need, that's, that's you know, starting to crack, and you can see it, right? You know when somebody is about to lose their marbles, is about to crack under pressure. So why would you just stand there and go, honey, honey, Get the popcorn ready. Let's watch this happen. Let's see how this ends. Or even worse, which is disgusting, but I've seen this happen. Oh, they're going to get what they deserve. Can't wait to see this roll out because they're going to get exactly what they deserve. Hmm. We have to, and we are encouraged in Holy Scripture to stand up for one another. Are we not family? Yes or no? Uh, of course. Should we not stand up for this family even more than our blood family? Yes. The answer is yes. These are the people that you're going to be spending eternity with after all. I don't know what the case is in your family, but it seems the majority of my family, I won't see them in heaven. At least not if status quo remains. Which is horrible to think about, but nonetheless, that's the truth. I suppose if I'm going to stand up for anybody in this world, it's going to be all of you. And that's what the Bible says. Particularly those members of the faith. Hmm. We see a specific call to action here that we ought not read over without pause. Why? Well, because we can all learn from what the Spirit has captured through this writer to this audience. Okay, um, besides Pat and Carol, go to Hebrews 12, 12. Because <laughs> they're already there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Love you guys. Hebrews 12, 12. Therefore, look at this. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And this includes encouraging one another. If you see someone in a weakened state, reach out, whatever that means. Show them that you, you care about them. Sometimes that's all it takes, is it not? Have you ever been on the receiving end of that? And you're like, oh my word, your encouragement came at precisely the right time. I was about ready to lose my marbles. Well, you ever think that that comes at a, a certain cost? Regarding the one who just gave it to you? Somebody has to sacrifice something. Oh, but, oh, ugh. It's the Super Bowl. I don't want to give up my time for somebody else. It's the big game. Ooh, couldn't they got sick at another time? Couldn't I just ignore the text that just came in? Couldn't I just pretend I didn't hear that news about so-and-so until after the game? Until after my personal... Ridiculousness is satisfied. 
Couldn't I just pretend for a little while? That doesn't sound family-like at all. That sounds like you've forgotten the last time somebody did that for you. That's all he's saying. He's like, listen, you guys are under a lot of pressure right now. You need each other. So be there for each other. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your own feet. See that so that no so that the limb which is impaired may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and the holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. And that's a shout out to those of you who have problem with forgiveness. Bitterness is the direct result of unforgiveness. Learn to forgive and stop, listen, stop throwing people's mistakes up in their faces. That is erosive behavior to a group that's meant to be unified. Raise your hand if you've never made a mistake. Oh my God, yeah, you're laughing, right? It's silly. Why do we tabulate other people's mistakes and then use it as some kind of a weapon for manipulation? Why do we do that to each other? Especially in a family like this one. It's grotesque. Every single one of us, to be fair, deserves hell. Maybe a little lighter sentence than that. Every single one of us, if the authorities knew, would spend time in jail. Every single one of us in here. Everybody in here is a criminal. Everybody is a low life. Everybody's a liar, a cheat. Everybody. The only difference between you and the next person is you didn't get caught. Right? So what are we doing? Verse 16, that there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it, the blessing that is, with tears. That passage is a wonderful form of encouragement from outside the congregation. Sometimes that's what it takes, right? This same shepherd tries yet another form of encouragement. He reminds them of the Sabbath rest that we believers are guaranteed in Christ. Now think about this week's blog, because unbelievers aren't guaranteed family privileges, even if contemporary evangelism promises it. Hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Contemporary evangelism is all about putting your hand in the cookie jar. More directly, that if a person doesn't enter this rest, they lack saving faith. Go to Hebrews 4 1. Hebrews 4, verse 1. Hebrews 4 1. Again, we're just getting context here, right? We're just getting context. Therefore, we must fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So this is a real fear. I have that same fear. I have to look out at this congregation and say, chances are at least one person in here is not a believer. That given the right circumstances, they will do as many in the past have from this very congregation. Left. I'm not saying people don't leave and go to other churches. I'm saying leave the faith. People just stop altogether, have no regard whatsoever, no inner drive for the truth, for Christ, for love. And that's a real fear. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. 
Always the possibility that some in the congregation weren't saved by faith yet. That's a real concern for a shepherd. Verse 2, For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also did, but the word they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united with those who listened with faith. In other words, the gospel falls on deaf ears with unbelievers who reject it. Now, as is often the case with shepherding, the writer cuts to the chase with this group. And he does it as, you know, as a corporate body. He's speaking to the church as a corporate body, calling them out as a result of discerning their waning fruit bearing, their waning fruit bearing. Think about this. This is something that we can all think about as a church. How are we doing? If you were to give, and I'm not saying raise your hand and answer, but if you were to give our church a grade, A through F, A, B, C, D, F, where would you in your own soul honestly give our church? What grade would you give our church in light of this kind of encouragement? Go to Hebrews 5.11. Hebrews 5, verse 11. And so the shepherd, just like myself, he will cut to the chase and say, yeah, what do you guys think? Where do you think you're at? And don't be delusional, be honest. Hebrews 5.11. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain why since you have become poor listeners. You have become poor listeners. You're not listening to the Spirit anymore. Maybe they weren't listening to Him. Maybe that was His fear. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So here's a shepherd who's essentially writing the same things I've taught year over year from behind this pulpit. Simple, practical things that keep your, let's call it, keep your ears open. Like, have you ever heard me say, read your Bibles? I mean, I have that like tattooed on my arm. I don't. I don't have any tats. I'm not that cool. Read your Bibles. Or take in all the grace God gives you through this blessed ministry. The messages. The blogs. The books. The fellowship. The music. All of it. This shepherd in Hebrews was compelled to encourage a church in crisis. What I've seen personally in my, I don't know, decade and a half almost, tenure, there is a one-to-one direct relationship between how much a person really does take in honestly and consistently everything I just listed coming from this ministry and the welfare and health of their spiritual life. There is a one-to-one correlation People who are diligent and obedient to the word of truth, who take in every bit of grace that God gives them from a ministry like this one, a faithful ministry like this one, they have their problems, but they do just fine. It's people who do not, people who are dull of hearing, people who have stopped listening. I don't just say this for my benefit, guys. Like, I don't just say, read your Bibles. And I'm like, you know, get the rod out and I... That's for your own benefit. I'd prefer you do all that stuff so that you do well spiritually. So you begin to realize the benefit. There's a cause and effect there. (laughs) If you do all that stuff, if you obey, then your life is a lot better off. So as a side note, encouragement doesn't always come in a pretty you know, soft little package with a bow on it. Sometimes it's tough love. And that's what this guy's saying. He's, he's saying, hey, I'm afraid for you guys as a group. 
I see you sort of sliding back here. I'm, you're starting to cause fear to percolate up in my soul. I see some bad things happening. I see people leaving the faith altogether. And nobody's, you know, nobody's, everybody's like, I'm, 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 they didn't have this back then, but I'm too busy watching the game. <laughs> I'm too busy with my own problems. Again, the point on the board is this was a church in crisis for several reasons. It had lost its original leaders. It was under constant attack. Some members were failing to fellowship together. And some had already defected or apostatized. There was a perfect storm brewing. And that's a scary thing for a shepherd. To cap it all off, the writer cuts to the chase once again, calling their attention to the sovereign God of the universe. I was having this conversation with Scott this week because if you really were to personify much of what the Spirit's been teaching from this pulpit in the last, I don't know, say seven years or so, certainly since 2015, since the Gospel Reload, it's that, look, man has a bad habit, especially in contemporary Christian churches nowadays, sadly, of putting himself at the center of the universe and God somehow orbits around him or her. And what the Lord has done for this congregation is said, get the hell out of my seat. I'm the sovereign, holy God of the universe. I'm the center. You go over there. And when you do that, when you read the Bible, everything changes. Everything changes. When you read the Bible with the sovereign, holy God of the universe as the center instead of you. Everything changes. The very way that you interpret Scripture changes fundamentally. Hmm. So if you were to personify or I guess uh, characterize this ministry over the last seven years or so, that's what it would be. God has effectively said, I want center stage. You can get off. So this shepherd essentially is saying the same thing. He's calling their attention to the sovereign, holy God of the universe. In a sense, he's saying, are you so forgetful that you've become dismissive of the power of God? Now this is a very serious charge, as it is to this day. Go to Hebrews 12.28. Hebrews 12.28. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let's show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And it's not because he did so much for you, it's because of who he is. That's the difference. There's this phony kind of reverence and awe today that says, well, since you gave me a whole big cookie jar, I'm so grateful. I love you, Lord. You're the best. Look, you could get a morsel. How about the simple fact that he saved you? And maybe he gives you a morsel after that. <laughs> he doesn't, but you get the point. It shouldn't matter. Your reverence and awe for him is because he's the sovereign. Look, I'm spitting... Wait, hold on. <laughs> Put some more on my screen for posterity. Right? It shouldn't matter. What the hell's wrong with us? That's the point. He saved you. You shouldn't have reverence and awe and gratitude because of the cookie jar. Does that make sense? This, this, look. He's worthy of all that, regardless of whether or not you go to heaven or hell. He has always been worthy of all of that, regardless of your spiritual status. And that's like a shocker nowadays. It's like we need something. We need what? Remind us, we need the cookie jar. 
to revere the holy God of the universe. The simple fact that he paid attention to us, as disgusting as we are, is a miracle. That's what he's been saying to this congregation. Have we forgotten that this is the sovereign, holy God of the universe? He didn't have to do anything for you. And it certainly shouldn't require a big, fat cookie jar for you to have gratitude towards him. Look at verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. Whoa. I was just thinking about writing a blog this morning on this very topic of gratitude towards the one who saved us, but we'll see what the Spirit decides. Again, the point of the board, this was a church in crisis for several reasons. It had lost its original leaders. It was under constant attack. Some members were failing to fellowship together, and some had already defected. There was a perfect storm brewing. So that completes our survey of the writer in the audience in the book of Hebrews. Now, we want to press on to establish what may already be obvious to most of you. We want to glean more content from the, uh, context from the book by seeking the purpose, plan, and even the genre of the book. What kind of book is this? What kind of message was this? And I'm grouping these three topics together because they are intrinsically related. And to be transparent, I don't want to overindulge you. I've had, to made, I've had to make some choices, let me put it that way. I couldn't, I don't have the time or the space to teach you everything that I've studied. Okay? So I don't want to overindulge you on the gory details on this portion of context. We're going to pick it up naturally along the way. But just please trust me when I say that... Um, even these theologians have really, they have a really bad habit of pontificating ad nauseum about such topics as genre. Oh, no, 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 it's this one. Oh, no, 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 it's this one. They write whole books and volumes, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just, how about we just get enough to get context and start reading? So I'm going to spare you all the details that I've had to go through. Um, and I, if I have my notes here, just be glad you don't have my job. Wink, wink. Now, to prime the pump, let me give you a couple of snippets that I do wholeheartedly agree with, okay? Up here on the board, on the genre of the book of Hebrews, from Thion, Hebrews is the only completely preserved homily from this period. And all a homily is is a sermon, Okay? Hebrews is the only completely preserved homily from this period. And then Philo, Hebrews is a, paren a paranetic homily, and paranetic just means persuasive, a persuasive sermon, okay? Paranetic homily in the Jewish Hellenistic tradition. So you already see that these are just two of many individuals that, myself included, that look at the book of Hebrews as a homily, as a sermon. And if you begin to read the book of Hebrews and have a voice, almost read it as if you can hear someone speaking it at the same time, you'll start to see it for what it is. It's an encouraging, persuasive argument. That's what it is. It's a sermon. As I've alluded to since the start of this series, this book is, in a very real practical sense, a sermon written that was to be read aloud to this congregation. Obviously, this shepherd wasn't on site. So he sent this book to be read to this congregation. And someone would have read it as if they were regurgitating a sermon. Just like if I had picked up, I don't know, one of Spurgeon's old sermons, I'm going to preach it. Because that's what it was meant to do, even though I received it in written form, let's say. 
I'm going to preach it like a shepherd would preach it. Okay? I'm not going to preach the Encyclopedia Britannica. Do you follow what I'm getting at? You don't preach expository things, things that explain. You preach homilies. Okay? With that said, our first principle, where we uh, use the book itself to establish a point up here on the board, the purpose, plan, and genre of Hebrews, Jewish Hellenistic homilies drew heavily from the Pentateuch, Penta five, first five books in the Bible, and Psalms. And that's what we're going to see. It was very commonplace for any sermon in that time period to lean on the Pentateuch and the Psalms, okay? which is precisely what the writer of Hebrews did. We'll see it. Now, I'm not calling out specific passages at the moment because there'd be too many. Just please remember the principle on the board as we're going to see a lot of Old Testament references from both of those, from those six books, as we read through the book. Just remember that point, that during that time period, sermons used and referred to quite often, it was characteristic of a sermon at that time, to look to the five, to draw from the first five books, and the book of Psalms. Okay? So, let's get to our second principle, which is another whopper, where we can settle in for a while, up here on the board. Purpose, plan, and genre of Hebrews. The overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is perinetic, persuasive. Biblical and theological exposition was subordinate to the writer's perinetical word of exhortation, which was meant to induce an emotional response. Okay, I'll get into this for a second. I almost jumped at the opportunity, but I know that this is in my notes, so just bear with me which is meant to induce an emotional response. It is a homily, a sermon, laced with rhetorical language. Language meant for speech, in other words, to be spoken Re rhetoric. You know, you often hear that in like political, you know, the rhetoric of this one or the rhetoric of that one. That's all it means. It's, mean, it's meant to be speech related. Laced with rhetorical language from a shepherd to a group of well-known sheep for the sake of encouragement. Hebrews 13, 22, 1, 1 to 4, 1, 5 to 4, 4 16, 5 and 6, 7, 1 to 10, 18, 10, 19 to 13, 25. You're like, that sounds like the whole book, because it kind of is. Well, doesn't that make sense, though? I mean, we're talking about the whole purpose, plan, and genre of the book. Now, I'm not going to take it all these things, because then we'd have to read the whole book. But I'll take you to certain spots, okay? Let me read it again. The overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is paranetic. It's persuasive. Biblical and theological exposition, that means things that explain things, was subordinate to the writer's paranetical word of exhortation, which was meant to induce an emotional response even. It was a homily, a sermon, laced with rhetorical language from a shepherd to a group of well-known sheep for the sake of encouragement. In other words, he was arguing for their encouragement. Just like someone who's trying to encourage you. What do they do? If they're good at encouraging you as a, you know, a member of God's family, they would go to Scripture. And they say, right here. Do you forget? And then you go, oh. right? You make that dumb face. Nobody does that? Only me? Right here. Oh, and then right here. This is why. This, this is what you need to remember. Right? Doesn't the Holy Spirit even do that? Bring to remembrance Holy Scripture? For what? To encourage you. To remind you. To argue for your encouragement. That's what this is. If you have Holy Scripture at your fingertips like this person did, that's exactly what he did. It's what I do every Sunday. I argue for your cause. 
I have a definite purpose. Sometimes you need encouragement. Sometimes you need to get a little bit of a, you know, a whooping. Sometimes you need soft love. Sometimes you need tough love. Whatever the case may be, I always go to Scripture to argue my case. And that's what a sermon typically does. I'm not going to sit here and just read the book with you. I'm not going to read someone's technical commentary with you. I'm trying to argue your own case. Why you should be encouraged. Why you should press on. Why you should be filled with gratitude. Why you should want to help one another. Why you should want to express your love for one another. You understand? Why grace should flow through you. Remember the grist mill? Remember that example? Why it should flow through you. Because you benefit. Why you should forgive. For your own benefit. Why you should give. Like Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. America's got it backwards, of course. Heck, America doesn't want to give even their own time for one another because the game's on. You know. That's all this is, honestly. I know that's a, a whopper of a statement there, but it's only because it all relates, and I didn't want you to miss the big picture. It's a lot there, but it's really not. It's just a shepherd doing what I do every Sunday, arguing for their encouragement with Holy Scripture. We find summary evidence at the end of the book where the writer essentially closes this book with his intended purpose for writing to them. Go to Hebrews 13, 22. We see it right at the end. I mean, it's not uncommon to summarize this way. If you're going to teach a sermon... It's not uncommon, right? Hebrews 13, 22. He says, I appeal to you, brothers. This is at the end of the book, right? Bear with my what? Word of exhortation. My word of encouragement. For I have written to you briefly. That's it. This is about you being encouraged. He basically summarizes it. He says, I hope this has been encouraging. I didn't write a lot, could have wrote a lot more, but I hope this brief conversation, this, this thing that I gave you, was encouraging. That's what he said. That's pretty much what I say at the end of most messages, especially really tough ones. I know there's a, maybe a little sting, or maybe this, maybe you got this going on in your head, and you're you know, going through things, and, but just be encouraged. If you remember one thing about this book, listen to me. If you remember one thing about this book, remember that it is a book of encouragement with Jesus being the substance of said encouragement. That's it. If you remember one thing, it's a book of encouragement where Jesus is the substance. Isn't that often what you need? I know it is for me. I'll be at work and it's crazy, and I'm a I got a bunch of, you know, most of the people, as I understand it, are unbelievers, so they don't understand what I'm talking about. One guy told me this, this is crazy. Do you guys know what, um, oh, I forget the exact name of it, but there's, um, there are new programs out there with, that are artificial intelligence where it'll write, like, it'll write a paper for you. The, the kids over here like, what? What's the name of that website? <laughs> It'll write term papers for you. I had a marketing friend of mine that said, check this out. I just threw in like all the bits and pieces of what I wanted to say from a marketing perspective, and it spit out like beautiful prose about marketing, like positioning the product and all that kind of stuff. I had someone say to me this week, this past week, hey, Ed, because they all know I'm a pastor. You could use this for your sermon. <laughs> I said, that's not how it works. I said, you know how much trouble I'd get in if I used AI to do a, a sermon for the Lord? <laughs> he said, well, look, you can put it in. Look, if I type in the meaning of life. It, I'm like, for real? 
But this is what they think. Is that not crazy? Why'd I get on that? I have no idea. I just want you to remember this. This book is a book of encouragement with Jesus at the center. That's it. Is that fair? But, now that's not all we're going to learn, so let's shoot a little higher. Before we break and look at other verses I've listed uh, that illustrate the rhetoric in this book, let me give you an analogy. Suppose you wish to become a medical doctor. I could send you information about required undergraduate coursework, what undergraduate colleges and degrees are best suited for entrance into medical school, what the statistics and acceptance rates into medical school are based on GPA and you know, MCAS scores, which is like the SATs for medical students, and so on and so forth. I could send you all that data. Is what I provided useful to you? Sure. Are you inspired by such things like facts and figures? Well, typically not, unless you already possess the requisite understanding of how said facts and figures apply to maybe becoming a good medical doctor. Maybe you're inspired that way, but you know, prior to that, I'll call it connective tissue existing, which typically implies some sort of personal experience. Such facts and figures are, you might say, sterile to you. You go, that's nice to know. It's a, you know, I should know that stuff. But not necessarily inspired to become a doctor. But yet, that's on the pathway of becoming a doctor. So, hmm. Now, what if I introduce you to a real medical doctor that spent some time in the Peace Corps, and now is the head of cardiology at Mass General Hospital. And she proceeds to share story after story about the satisfaction of being a medical doctor. She shares how she just saved a dying child the night before, and how when she served in the Peace Corps, she gave life-saving medicine to thousands of refugees and how even though she had many doubts about her fitness to be a medical doctor along the way, or you know, if she'd even make it through medical school, that looking back, she wouldn't change a thing. Are you more or less likely to be inspired by the facts and figures or the testimony of a real doctor? So, obviously, there's an important distinction here. And it's akin to the one I'm making regarding the book of Hebrews up here on the board. The difference between exposition and perinesis. And again, perinesis just means an argument. Okay? The goal of exposition is to explain something. For example, when a New Testament writer explains an Old Testament passage just an explanation. The goal of perinesis is to persuade. For example, when a writer knits together biblical doctrines with circumstances, context, to encourage someone to think or act a certain way. Do you see the difference? Exposition explains, perinesis argues for a purpose. So in my medical doctor example, I gave you both. When I described the facts and statistics regarding what it takes to become an MD, that was exposition. Hey, look, this is what is required. Here are the cold hard facts. I'm going to explain it to you. That's exposition. Now when the MD came along to help persuade you to become an MD versus, say, another career choice, that was perinesis. 
They argued for a purpose. It's also worth noting that, in general, written communication is often best suited for exposition. That's why you do have Wikipedia, or in my old days, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica and all that kind of stuff. It's purely exposition, and it's important. But it has a place, right, like Solomon would say? There's a place for everything. Likewise, it's worth noting that verbal communication is often best suited for paranesis. If you're going to argue your case, have you ever tried recently to argue your case with a text message? Oh, my word. You want to make things immediately worse? Get in an argument over text. That's why, like, social media is, a, is it's stupid. People that engage on social media in arguments are literally morons. I don't care if you're the smartest. In that moment, you are a moron. You cannot argue the way you need to argue. You need to communicate. You also know, I mean, I, I forget the statistics, so excuse me if I'm wrong, but the last I remember, I want to say it's, I think it's north of maybe even 80% of all communication is nonverbal. The fact that you're looking at my mug, my movement, my expressions, all of it, my cadence, my intonation, all of it, it matters. I can express a lot more to you. If I'm present, is that fair? And therefore, if I'm trying to argue a case, I mean, that's why, think of a courtroom. A good defense attorney, why, they argue their case, their closing statements, they matter. Because that, whether it's right or wrong, can sway 12 people. So you get the difference. Exposition lends itself, not exclusively, but lends itself to what? Uh, written communication, exposition. Verbal lends itself to paranesis or argument. This is why I said at the outset of this series that the book of Hebrews was very likely meant to be read aloud to an audience because of its style, its genre. It is paranetical, primarily. Not that it doesn't have expository elements to it, as we'll see with Melchizedek later on. This will all make a little more sense as we press on. I'm just putting this on sort of on your radar. This is context. This helps us. Just wanted to introduce you to a couple of terms that you will hear me use. Again, the point on the board, the difference between exposition and paranesis. The goal of exposition is to explain something. For example, when a New Testament writer explains an Old Testament passage, the goal of paranesis is to persuade, for example, when a writer knits together biblical doctrines with circumstances to encourage someone to think or act a certain way. All right, let's get back to our primary point up here on the board. The overarching theme of the book of Hebrews is paranetic, persuasive. Biblical and theological exposition was subordinate. It wasn't this person's primary reason for writing. Subordinate. So the writer's paranetical word of exhortation, we just saw that in Hebrews 13, 22, which was meant to induce an emotional response even. In other words, he wanted them to get jazzed up, just like I want you to get jazzed up on a Sunday morning. It's tough out there, amen? It helps to have someone in front of you that's, that's encouraging you, that's coaching in a way, that's helping, that's arguing for your case. It is a homily, a sermon laced with rhetorical language from a shepherd to a group of well-known sheep for the sake of encouragement. Let's look at the rhetorical style of this book next. As a side note, again, rhetoric is a style often used to argue a point. That's why you, know, you hear it with politicians. Politicians are always arguing their point. That's their job almost. So you hear people, oh, they, I don't like that guy's rhetoric, you know, this kind of a thing. That's all it is. But it does lend itself. That, that type of speech, that type of arguing, right? It lends itself to paranesis, persuasive speech. That's all I'm saying, right? 
I've already got the book of Hebrews framed out for us, even though you can't see it yet. But here's the framework, just to tease it a little bit, and then I'll close. I'm going to sing and eat some food. Here's the framework, right? The rhetoric in Hebrews. Okay, So this is just, what was this writer saying? What was the construct throughout the whole book? How did he, in other words, how did he present his argument? I'm, sure, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure there's probably a whole class in law school. If it's not titled rhetoric, it's something like that. It includes rhetoric. You know, this is how you stand before, uh, you know, uh, a jury and present your case. You should frame it this way. You should open up crisply, state your case, and then you should, you know, have sort of a, a theme. You should have a statement of plausibility, you should have demonstrated proof, and then you should close, again, tightly, like we just saw in Hebrews 13, 22. Bear with me with my word of exhortation. You just saw all my proof. You just saw it. I opened up, and then I went through this with you. I hope you're encouraged. Right? That's rhetoric. That's, that's what this book is. It's a sermon. So there's a prologue, verse 1, 1 to 4. There's a thematic statement, verse 1, 5 through 4, 16. Statement of plausibility, chapters 5 and 6. Demonstration of proof, chapter 7, 1 through 10, 18. And then closing inspiration. Chapter 10, 19 through 13, 25. And that's what we have here. So I just want to, because we're out of time, I just want to read the prologue before closing. Remember, we do have food and music after, so stick around, please. As we read this passage, keep your eye on who, listen, stop turning. Keep your eye on, this is important. Keep your eye on who the writer puts immediately front and center at the opening of this beautiful book. He could have done, he could have opened up a, a, I guess he wouldn't, but you know what I'm saying. He could have written different ways with different purpose, different plan, with a different genre even. But this is what he chose. And this is what God the Holy Spirit inspired. It's important. Look at how he opens up. Are you all at Hebrews 1 1 yet? Come on, let's go. Let's go. Chop, chop. <laughs> all right? Hebrews 1 1. Let's just keep that in mind. Look at how the writer chose to open up. This is the prologue. Don't miss it. Hebrews 1 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. How's that for an opening? Who's this going to be about anyways? What's this book going to be about? Who, pray tell, did the writer exalt immediately at the opening of this book? Jesus Christ. So if this is the prologue, what is this book about? It's about Jesus Christ. I said this ten times, if not once already, in this series. This whole book is about the exaltation of Jesus Christ for your encouragement. If 
God is for us, who can be against us? He sent his son for us. How can we not be encouraged by that? Regardless of your circumstances. You might say, but you don't know what I'm going through. I'm sick. I'm that. I'm torn up. I got problems. I got, you know, whatever. Seriously? How does that all compare to Jesus Christ? If you take your eyes off of yourself and your own problems for a moment and just look to him, I mean, everything else just is white noise. You're going to be in heaven with him face to face for all of eternity. Put that into perspective. This life, these challenges, it's a drop in the bucket. It doesn't even compare. I don't care if you're the biggest jackass in the history of mankind. You look in the mirror and you go, you are the biggest jackass. And you say that because yesterday was a train wreck. It doesn't matter. Get over yourselves. Jesus Christ. He upholds the entire universe by the word of his own power. He says, I got this. If I got all this, then I certainly got you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you sometime soon. It's just, folks, it's just white noise. And that's what this congregation needed to hear. And frankly, that's what you all need to hear. Look, I'll say this. You have zero hope. Zero. You have zero hope of understanding this book if you miss this very point. And when's the last time prior to this series that you opened up the book of Hebrews and said, this book is about the exaltation of Jesus Christ for my encouragement. Honestly, be honest. Most people pick at it like grapes. Well, I gotta teach a sermon on getting people back in their seats. So I go to Hebrews 10, 25. Do not forsake assembling together, as some do for the sake of encouragement. So I plucked that out. Oh, I got to teach a sermon on apostasy, so I got to go to Hebrews 6. Or I got to, you get the point. Oh. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God. It's a double-edged sword. Oh, hallelujah. What's the context? I don't know. <laughs> but what a wonderful verse. book is about the exaltation of Jesus Christ for the sake of encouragement. You have zero hope of understanding it if you miss that one point. Zero. We're out of time. You guys excited? This is, this is, gonna be, this is a fun ride. This one's fun. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this fun ride. Thank you for putting us on it. Thank you for loving in us, us enough to put us here as a family to encourage us in this unique way. Thank you for Holy Scripture that's uniquely able to do that. Thank you for this building, for this church, for those who support it, Father. We're just so grateful for your grace, your mercy, your love. We just ask your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls and our families. And your will be done out to a world that needs the truth so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.